Well, it's great to have you here this morning. Thank you so much for weathering the weather and being here uh, to worship God in spirit and in truth, especially for those of you uh, who were here last week. And you know that today is a class day. We're doing something that's going to be a study. It's study style. This is going to be a learning style lesson. Uh, We'll get to some other style of lessons as, of course, the year unfolds, but today is a day for you and for I to be students, okay? So don't get all worked up about anything else but just learning today, and if you have a notepad and paper, that's great. I asked uh, if you have that to bring it. If not, then get the DVD afterwards, watch it online, listen to it on a CD. This is a really important message for us to go out into the world with, and here's why. We have been called to be part of the cause of Christ. As God's children, he is counting on us to represent him today. It's not the responsibility of the apostles today. It's our responsibility today to go into all the world, preach the good news message to all creation. It's our call, amen? And so the cause then has this idea connected to love and lies. Last week, we found that our cause for Christ is connected to love and lies. We're following the cause of Christ because of the love of God, because of the love of Jesus, because He has died for us, He's been raised for us, He sent the Spirit to us, He has washed us with His blood. There's an empty tomb because of His love. And for those who actually love God with the same love that He loves us, we're called to do what Jesus came to do, and that is to seek and save that which is lost. Our lives are not to be put in this place where, well, I want to find as as much comfort as I can, to buy the nicest house that I can, to earn the most money that I can, to drive the nicest car that I can, to find the nicest people that I can, to have the nice kids that I can, to have the nice clothes that I can find. That's not what life's about. Life's about getting from this earth to live in heaven forever. This earth is not our home. We're just passing through. And that our idea and our clothing should be Christ. And that our objective in this world is to serve Him and lead souls to be with Him. Now the lie part. There's a guy out there, his name is Satan. He is listed in the scriptures as the father of lies. Amen? So that means that every single lie that is told in this world, it was birthed from Him. And that old snake, that Satan, boy, he's a smart cat. I'll tell you that right now. And he has done such a wonderful job drumming up all sorts of lies for people to tell. The unfortunate thing is, is he's also figured out how to have lies infiltrate Christianity. As a matter of fact, he's figured out a way to create several quote-unquote Christian systems that have the name of Christ and use some scriptures in the Bible, but Satan has actually led and taught people to use this book, scriptures in this book, and still use them connected to a lie. Isn't that amazing? Now what that means then is that there are several people out there, good-hearted, sincere, loving, kind people, who have been lied to. There are teachers out there who are teaching falsely because they were lied to and believed that what they were taught was true. They've taken it up to be truth and they teach it, although what they're doing is teaching a lie. And what that means then is, is that it is our job because of the love to go out and expose the lies. So that those who really do seek the truth of God will be corrected with love to become part of the truth. And that's why we're doing this series, because there's so many lies out there about what faith is and the faith that saves is. And the one that we discussed a little bit last Wednesday or Sunday night, and I want to make sure that I mention it again today is that what seems to be the biggest discussion where some of the greatest lies are told is when it comes to at what point do you go from being lost in sin to born again? 
When exactly are you converted to Christianity? The dispute will not be about, well, you have to love the Lord. They'll all say amen to that. You've got to be a follower of His. They'll say amen to that. You've got to be dedicated and serve Jesus. Most folks will say that. Where the dispute comes in and where the rest of the religious system that they have comes from is then this theology or teaching, at what point do you become a New Testament born-again Christian? And there is only one truth that teaches that. There's only one truth out there that shows how to become born again. I was doing a little bit of studies this week, and and I appreciate I give some credit to Todd uh, Hanker here. Todd's a a fantastic, uh, faithful man in Christ. He's an encouragement to me, so I have to give credit where credit is due. And so Todd put this thought in my head this last week. He's helping actually do a study guide with a series, for this series, so that when we're done with this series, there'll be a study guide that you can actually have and go out to your friends and neighbors with and use the study guide to help study what we're studying with them. And he said, Tad, I made an addition to uh, the study guide, and, and one of the additions that I've made is that I wanted to show where praying the sinner's prayer came into being. And I thought at that moment, that's brilliant. Because really what it is is that many people today, the lie that's being told or lies that are being told come from the perspective that people look at the Scriptures and study the Scriptures and apply the Word of God from our day backward. In other words, you take what you think, what you feel, what happens in society today, our perspectives on life and the world, and our perspectives of what God and Jesus is all about, and then we look at the Bible from our time back. So then what happens is we look for bits and pieces of Scripture, sections of Scriptures that matches what we think and feel and have already applied about God today. As opposed to the chronological study of God's Word, the way the Lord had always intended His Word to be looked at, from the Bible times forward. So that we can see what He meant, who He was talking uh, to, and what they needed to do, and then apply that to our day today. See, the Word of God is still alive and active. It's not dead, and it has never changed. God is the same yesterday, today, and will be forever, and so is His truth here. What changes is society and people, and society and people try to change what this means because they look at the Bible from this day backward instead of His day and way forward. Make sense? So I thought, wow, what a great suggestion. When did the New Testament church actually start? Well, Acts chapter 2, A.D. 30, 33, depends on what calendar you use. So we learn then at what time and what point somebody is born again based upon the chronological study of Scripture. Well, then the question is, well, when did the sinner's prayer for salvation begin? Was it on the same day? Well, we don't see that, do we? The actual truth is, is that, I'll give you a really quick history lesson. In the 300s A.D., the Roman government decided to take control of the Lord's church. Guess what happens when the government tries to take control of religion? Doesn't go very well now, does it? When the Roman government took control of Christian religion, they took it and modified it, and it became what we know today as Catholicism. Catholicism then was the main Christian religion for a long, long time. We get to the 1500s, and then there's the Reformation movement. Martin Luther, Calvin. They decide that, listen, what the the Catholic Church is doing and saying and teaching isn't right. We need to reform what the teachings are about God. And so they do. And by the way, Calvin and Luther, particularly Calvin, though, Calvin is the originator of the Baptist theology, at least most of it as well as the Christian Reformed movement today. And I did some research, and I found out, did you know Calvin believed that baptism by immersion was necessary to be born again? Now, when's the last time you've heard of a Christian Reformed church today teaching that? They've left even their teachers' teachings. Well, in the 1600s then, this has changed. They still believe that baptism was necessary. They were just making some adjustments to the Catholic Church. We get to the 1700s, and there's a guy by the name of Eleazar Wielak. 
And Eleazar Wielak in 1730 came up with this brilliant idea. At least he thought it was brilliant. He came up with what's called the mourner's row, the front row of the auditorium. It was called the mourner's row. And what this man did is that he, while he was preaching, would call out by name people he believed to be sinners. Imagine a worship service like that. <laughs> Old preacher boy up here going at it, talking about sin, talking about hell and condemnation. And Paul, by the way, you're going there. You better come right up here and sit in the mourner's bench and mourn because you're a sinner whose soul's in trouble. Could you imagine a worship service like that? So they created the mourner's bench where then the preacher and other people would take these folks in the front row, pray for them, and baptize them if they needed to be baptized. All right? We get to the 1800s, and in the 1800s, there's a guy by the name of Charles Grandison. Charles changed it from the mourner's bench to the anxious seat, the front row of the auditorium. He didn't call people out by name, but what he did was preach hellfire and brimstone every single Sunday. And he scared people out of their seat and into the front seat. Once he did that, he then helped them have these prayers to repent and confess their sins. Not for salvation, but for people who were already saved. And of course, those that needed to be baptized were baptized. We get to the mid or the late 1800s, and there's a guy by the name of Dwight Moody. You ever hear of him? Yep. Well, Moody added the inquiry room, and what he did then was he took this idea that those that were in the front row, what we needed to do was find a special a place for them. So after the worship service was finished, the front row people would go to a certain room, and in that certain room, counselors and the preacher would talk to these folks and start praying over them if they had a need to be saved. Well, we get to the late 1800s and early 1900s, and there's a man by the name of K.A. Torrey. He introduced instant salvation with prayer in 1899. Then a man by the name of Billy Sunday took over, and he refined that a little bit. And maybe you've heard of this guy, Billy Graham. He and his co-workers were the first to list it as the sinner's prayer for salvation in the 1950s. The sinner's prayer originated in the late 1800s and was used for salvation not until the 1900s. Now I want you to think about that. We have people who believe and have been lied to that the sinner's prayer can be traced all the way back to Bible times for salvation, when in fact history teaches that it didn't come into existence until just over a hundred years ago. Isn't that sad? To think that people have been duped into this and they've been taught this, where then they look and try to find scriptures that back up the idea that you can pray the prayer and have Christ come into your heart. Because that's what they've been taught. And they've been lied to in church. It's time for a new awakening. It's time for the Lord's church to know what the Lord teaches and have that love to go out and conquer those lies. Amen? But to do that, we need to know what the Scriptures say. I sounded just like Ed Wharton at that time, didn't I? So, pen and paper, ready to go. We began in Matthew chapter 3 where John the Baptist was baptizing people, immersing people into water for the forgiveness of sins connected to repentance. Remember, baptism is just a generic word that means immersed. And it means nothing special. Baptism in and of itself means nothing special. You can be baptized in a lake when you go swimming. You can be baptized in a bathtub just because you're taking a bath. Simply because you're immersed into something. Baptism is only defined by the intention of the person when they go into the baptism. 
And we know that John was teaching that people needed to go down into water, immersed into water, baptized into water, by faith believing that God would forgive them of their sins and connect them to repentance. Baptism had always been originated at the very beginning of our New Testament for the forgiveness of sins. Always. We then have Jesus who was baptized, and when he was immersed in water, he received the Holy Spirit. He talks to John and John, or, um, Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and he tells Nicodemus that if you want to go to the kingdom, if you want to be in the kingdom, if you want to go to heaven, you need to be born again. What? Of water and spirit. In Matthew 16, he tells Peter, listen, Peter, here's the keys to the kingdom. The kingdom is connected to water and spirit. You're going to get the keys to open up the door to help people get in. John chapter 14, 15, and 16, Jesus tells his apostles and his apostles only what their job and duty is, is to take over the ministry when Jesus leaves and goes to heaven. And he's going to empower them with special gifts of the Holy Spirit so they can hear the word straight from heaven to them so they can preach it and write it down so that as the generations after the apostles can have this book that we call the Bible. Because God's word is the only truth out there, and the standard of truth is found here and nowhere else. Why? Because there's a father of lies out there, and anything said contrary to what God says is a lie. So what we need to do is have the standard of truth accessible to us. Guess what? Here it is. Most important book ever. If this isn't at the center of your life, I will hopefully pray with you and help you get this book to be the center of your life because it is the center of all truth. So, Jesus tells the apostles that when he leaves, he's going to send the Holy Spirit to them to do this very thing. Jesus goes to the cross, he dies, three days later he's raised from the dead, and then he gathers together with his apostles again and says, listen, those that believe and are baptized shall be saved. Go into all the world, preach the good news message to all creation. Doing what? Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1. We find Jesus leaving. From Luke 24, we found out that Jesus said, you boys, the apostles need to go to Jerusalem because that's where I'll send the Holy Spirit to you guys. At the beginning of Acts chapter 2, we find the apostles in Jerusalem. Jesus has ascended to heaven and they receive the Holy Spirit in a miraculous way and they start preaching and teaching the Word of God to the masses. When the masses hear the Word of God, what do they do? 3,000 of them, they're pierced to the heart. The Holy Spirit at work with them touches their heart and they say, what are we supposed to do? And then the answer is as clear as clear can be. The keys to the kingdom, to get into the kingdom, Peter says very clearly, you need to repent. And you need to be baptized. What for? For the forgiveness of sins to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's exactly the system that Jesus had set up from the very beginning, beginning in Matthew chapter 3 all the way to Acts chapter 2. There isn't any other place to be new birthed. If you have done this, please come forward. I'm not calling the sinner out. If any of you have been born never having gone through a woman's womb... Nobody? I mean, we all had to go through the womb to be born? Church, you have to go through the tomb to be born again. You have to go through the tomb of water to be born again. No other place, no other location. Jesus sets that up. Now, if you would, please, open your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 2. And I will be as quick as I can. You guys... Hit that for me, please. My clicker's not clicking. I've got a non-clicking clicker. The click has gone out of the click. It's a click-free zone. Nope. It's still a click-free zone. All right. Faith Chain 14, Acts chapter 2. While they get this thing fixed, 
we find out that they are, in verse 38, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39, for the promise is for you, for your children, for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to him. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word, what word? Who is his word? Where does it come from? It comes from God through the Holy Spirit to the apostles. The word of God was preached. And the response that Jesus taught them to teach is to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. So those who received his word, verse 41, were baptized. And there were about 3,000 souls added that day. To what? To his kingdom. To the church. To his body. This is where it all begins. And then if we had time, we'd go through and we'd see how love, I mean, really, the, the love of the first century church in its purest form. You know what they did? They hung out with everybody. They ate together. They listened to the apostles' teachings on a daily basis. Why? Because they knew the word of God was to be the guide of their life. They didn't just want to get baptized and go, whew, now I'm part of the church. Now what should we do? Let's hang out, let's party, let's play, let's go, let's do things that we want to do. Life is not like that when you join the army of God. When you sign up with Him, you sign up with Him and you say, that's it. Now Lord, You are the center of my life. And so these folks knew it. That faith meant a way of life, not just part of life. And these folks loved God, studied the Word of God so that they could apply that to every aspect of their life. And they shared what they had in common. If somebody was in need, somebody who had something would sell it, and then they would give the money to the person who was in need. They began this big family and community where everything belonged to everybody else. How does that sound to you? Not a great response. Makes folks nervous today. Why? We love our stuff a lot more than we love our people. Church is not supposed to be like that. It's supposed to love God more than anything else, and we know that God owns everything, and that means it belongs to Him. And if He needs us to cash that in, to give cash to somebody in the church who needs it for something that is a necessity in life, then we'll go ahead and do that. Why? Because it belongs to Him anyway. And if it belongs to Him, it belongs to us. Church, we're a community of believers. We're a family of faith. We are not independent entities that just stray off and do whatever we want to do. When you sign up with Christ, you sign up with the rest of us. That's the Lord's church. And we see that kind of love reflected in the first century church. This is who they were. And then guess what? People hearing the Word of God... People seeing the body of God active, people watching how these apostles have these miraculous abilities, draw folks in to want to give their lives to God. The whole action and activity of the church working together with all the empowerment of God with His truth works. It worked then, it'll work today. But here's what I wanted to show you. That this pattern that has been set up about at what moment you go from being dead to alive. Remember, if you don't have love, you're dead anyway. If you don't give your life to Jesus the way He says, you're dead. If you don't give your life to Jesus the way He says and love Him while you're doing it, you're dead. It takes all this. It takes love and dedication. It takes faith and truth. It takes all these things. Now watch this pattern as we go. Can I click it now? Hey, that's great. Oh, why did it go backwards? There we go. Fantastic. Acts chapter 8, watch this pattern. Whew. Let's skip down to, for time's sake. I, I suggest starting in verse 1, but we'll skip down to verse 4. Therefore, those had been scattered, went about preaching the word. What word? That's right, God's word. His way? Yes. Now, and Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip. And they heard and saw signs which he was performing. Uh, for in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice. And many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was much rejoicing in that city. Now, there was a certain man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. 
And they all, from smallest to the greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, this man is what is called the great power of God. But it was a lie, by the way. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with magic arts. But when they believed Philip preaching and good news about the, say it, kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized. There it is again. If we continued on in Acts chapter 8, we find this Ethiopian eunuch. And this Ethiopian eunuch was driving along, and he's reading the Scriptures. And by the way, this Ethiopian eunuch was not right in the path of somebody. He was out there in this chariot on the road. But God knows as he sees all people and he sees the hearts of people, this eunuch was a seeker. And God knew that this guy wanted to give his life to him. So guess what God made sure happened? I'll make sure that a guy who's carrying my truth is going to meet up with this guy who's on the road being pulled. And I will make sure that they get together, no matter where it's located, so the seeker can be saved. Church, this is God's plan and pattern all over the world. Somebody says, well, no, this can't be true because there are tribes and people all over the world that just don't know the gospel. Listen, if they're seekers, God will find them. Because he's that kind of God. So here's a seeker. And so he's reading along in the eunuch, verse 34, and said, Philip, uh, uh, Philip said, please tell me of whom does this prophet say this, of himself or of someone else? And Philip, opening his mouth, the beginning from the Scriptures, he preached Jesus to him. This guy was in the Old Testament reading, and he's reading these prophecies, the Ethiopian eunuch. And then Philip says, so who's he talking about? Well, I need to know. Somebody got to teach me. That's great. So where do we begin? We'll begin in the Old Testament. We'll start talking about God the Creator, the sin in the garden. We'll start talking about the flood. We'll talk all about the plan of salvation, the seed of God. We'll talk about the Old Testament law and the sacrificial system. We're going to get all that stuff in place so that you truly understand that God's plan goes all the way back to His beginning. And then, then I will tell you about Jesus, how he comes to this earth, born of a virgin, and all the wonderful things that he's done, and how he died on the cross, a sinless person, offering himself as the Lamb of God, sacrificial back to God. God accepts that payment in full, and he's raised then again on the third day, never to die again. He is the Savior, and he shed his blood to cleanse your soul. So what do you think, Ethiopian eunuch? Well, what must I do, I'd imagine, well, let's see. And Philip opened his mouth, verse 35, and beginning from the Scriptures, he preached Jesus to him, and as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, Look, water. What prevents me from being baptized? Now, how could the eunuch respond in this way unless Philip had told him that baptism was necessary to become part of Christ? So much so that he goes, wait, slow down. There's water right there. What keeps me from being baptized? And then his response was, well, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water. Philip as well as the eunuch. And he baptized him. Whew. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. We've got this guy by the name of Saul. Saul is being a man who is faithful to God, he believes. He is a guy who loves God so much, and he's an Old Testament guy. He believes that these Christians are sinners, and it's a false religion. So Saul does what he can to stop the false religion. He is serious. He is sincere. He loves God. And he's killing God's people. I want you to think about this. Remember what we're talking about. Sincerely wrong. So Jesus has a face-to-face -face meeting with him. I'm going real fast. And Jesus then shuts his eyes, puts scales over them, tells him to go to a place, and you sit down and you hang out because I'm sending a guy by the name of Ananias. Ananias then shows up, verse 17, Ananias departed and entered the house. 
And after laying hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he arose and was baptized. Another conversion example. Well, some might say, Ted, um, he was saved beforehand because um, um, Ananias calls him a brother. Well, yes, he called him a brother, but a brother in the Jewish faith because Ananias was afraid of Saul. Laid hands on him to remove the scales on his eyes. He was baptized for the forgiveness of sins. How do we know? Flip your Bibles forward to Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Now Saul's name is Paul. Paul is describing what his conversion was like. And he says in verse 16, And now why do you delay? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Why was Saul slash Paul baptized? To wash away his sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to shut it down. Because I don't want to rush through Acts chapter 10. We're in a study, aren't we? Bring your pen and paper next week too. Church, this is vitally important. Because do you know people who have been lied to about how to become a Christian? Raise your hand if you know of somebody who's been lied to about how to become a Christian. Do you love that person? Now, are, are you angry at them because they believe a lie, or are you angry at the lie? Sure. Man, I'm angry at the lie. I'm not angry at the person. I'm angry because they've been lied to for generations. And I want to do all I can to help be, have them set free, and the truth shall set you free. And that means that's us delivering the truth. So we need to be students and know how to go all the way back and teach all the truth so that when they get to the place of going now, what do I need to do to give my life to Jesus to be born again? They'll already have the answer because God's word will tell them, not you. This is not a matter of opinion. This is not a matter of, well, some people interpret. This is not this. God interprets what he wants the way he wants and says it the way he says it. And then we are to be a people who study his way, his interpretation, and simply show people what he says. It's up to them to decide what they're going to do. But we need to get that message out, church. This message is being recorded right now. It's being live streamed. Live streamed all over this country. Matter of fact, all over the world. This message right now is a worldwide message. You can get onto our website right now, and there are people watching it around this country right now. And then it'll be taken, the tape will be taken, and it'll be made into something that's permanent. It's put on there, digitally recorded, so then more people from around the world can watch this. And by the way, we have folks watching our messages from around the world. Do you know people in Russia have clicked on our site to watch a sermon? There have been people in the Middle East click on and watch. There have been people in Texas, which is a foreign country, So that souls may be saved. Now you have a local ministry. Do you love the Lord? Have you been baptized for the forgiveness of sins? Do you love others? And those that you love who have been lied to, your job is to go out with truth open and teach them the truth and love so that they may be saved. Wouldn't it be a shame, wouldn't it just be a heartbreak that if the people that you're thinking of right now died, believing that they're going to heaven because they've been told what they think is the truth, but it's a lie. Wouldn't it be frightening to bring up that scene again that we looked at in Matthew chapter 7? Lord, Lord, what do you mean? Wouldn't that be frightening to think of people that we love and had a chance to tell them the truth, but we didn't because we were afraid. 
And our fear is going to stop them from having a chance to get to heaven? May it never be. Our ignorance is going to keep us from telling them the truth? May it never be. That's why we don't do church like normal traditional church around here. We do church to be equipped and to edify and to love. We do church the way I believe Jesus teaches church to be. And that's to encourage and to educate, to equip and to love, to serve and to give. You have a need today? Turn to somebody and say, hey man, I'd sure like you to pray for me. You've got a need today? Man, come to the elders and talk to us. We can see what we can do. You got something going on in your life? Don't leave here empty. Leave here filled with the hope of knowing that the Lord's kingdom is going to help you today. Because that's what we do as family. So if you, if you have a need, we still carry on this tradition of the front row thing, by the way. And it's not the mourner's bench, and it's not the anxious bench. It's not that. It's just a place that we can recognize that you are a person who is identifying yourself as a person in need. So if you have a need, please come forward. And most assuredly, if you need to give your life wholly to Christ by being buried with Him through baptism, do so as we stand and sing.